Welcome to the Life Self Mastery Podcast, where we bring in entrepreneurs who have created online businesses and improved their lifestyles. Here's your host, Rohit Malhotra. Hi everyone, this is Rohit from Life Self Mastery. Today I'm excited to have Michael McFall, who's a co-CEO of Piggy Coffee, which is the US third largest coffee franchisee, and he's the author of the book Grind. Uh, uh, Macfall is also an alumni of Kalam Mazu uh, Coffee and uh, Big B, uh, Big B Coffee has more than 230 locations, which he co-founded uh, with Bob Fish, who is the founder uh, of, of the coffee chain. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you. It's great to be here. Awesome. So, you know, uh, you, you have a very interesting journey because you, you start, started off as a, as a, you know, a barista in, in the retail chain and you went on to become um, uh, you know, the co CEO of uh, US third largest coffee franchise, which is like the like the American dream, the the as in the richest story. So, yeah, can, can you just walk through us uh, what got you interested in coffee and been there uh, in the industry for 25 years and uh, what keeps you going and what was the story all about? Yeah, well, you know, um, when I when I got into the business, I started as a as a what we minimum wage barista. Uh, and I was, I was working in the store from open until 2 p.m. I had a position at the university uh, in East Lansing, and I was on a research project. And frankly, I was just, I was just preparing to go back to graduate school. And so, but, but, but what happened is I fell in love with the business. I fell in love with showing up to work every morning and preparing coffee for people. And people would walk in, and it was, it was an honor to engage them and to um, serve them a cup of coffee, but also to send them out on their day uh, with a little extra uh, positive energy, a little extra skip in their step, right? So, so that was, that was uh, how I became interested in the coffee business is I loved going to work inside of the store. And, and then we ended up, uh, I didn't own that first store. I, my, my business partner, Bob Fish, owned that first store. He and I started a conversation about getting me more involved in the business. And, you know, the, the, uh, the legend goes that he was interviewing me to take a position as a manager within the business. And we ended up going for a walk and we went on about a four hour walk uh, around East Lansing, Michigan. And at the end of that walk, we shook hands and agreed to start an enterprise to grow the business and grow the brand. We weren't sure what that was going to look like. We weren't sure how we were going to proceed, but we were committed to uh, each other and we were committed to growing that business. And so we did form an entity uh, that would have been, that walk would have been in March of 1997. Uh, We did form an entity in June of 1998. Uh, We became legal to franchise the company, which was ultimately the decision we made on how to grow the business model was the business model we chose was franchising and we became legal to, uh, to franchise in January of 1999. Uh, And, you know, we just started working with people and uh, signing contracts and opening stores. And that's what we've done ever since. Um, And, you know, there was, there was a moment where we owned stores and we were franchising stores at the same time. Ultimately we decided to, sell all of the stores that we own, and then just focus in on the franchise entity. Oh, very interesting. Uh, you know, uh, what, what do you think is the success behind a successful retail franchise uh, since you own, own, uh, own the properties? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you control the, uh, the customer experience? You know, I've worked for a, uh, for a, uh, for a hotel marketplace called Oyo Rooms. And, you know, when you don't own the customer experience, you know, there's always problems. Obviously, the problems here in Southeast Asia and Asia are very different from there in US, uh, where people are a lot more conscious about customer experience. So, so what, what uh, you know, what would be your uh, thoughts on building a successful, uh, you know, franchise retail chain? Well, whenever I talk to somebody who's interested in starting a franchise company, I always coach them that they better be fully committed to the success of the franchisee's store. And you have to be fully engaged in driving the success of the units, even though you don't own them, right? And I find at times when I'm talking to other people in franchising that they 
look at the owner, the franchise owner, um, in, in, in not necessarily a positive light. What we've always tried to do, well, our, our whole mission has been, is, is one, to maintain a really, really good relationship with that franchise owner, and then do everything in our power to, to help them be successful in their business. And so, you know, we're both, my partner and I are both educators at heart. We, we enjoy uh, coaching and teaching people. And that's really what a franchise company is, is you bring these people in, they don't know the business, um, and you have to take them, and then it's your responsibility to turn them into a successful owner, a successful business person in their location. And so if you aren't an educator, a mentor, a coach at heart, the franchise business is probably going to be difficult because you can't, you can't run a franchise and be um, in a dictator, you know, like it just doesn't work because you have all these independent business owners that they are, they'll do their own thing if, if you're not, you know, if you're not with them and supporting them and so on. So I think the key to the success of building a franchise company is that mentality of your, your sole effort has to be in making them successful. If you make the unit successful, the franchisee successful, then your company will be successful. There's never been a franchise company in history that became successful without the units being successful. <laughs> it just doesn't work, right? Right, right. right. Interesting. And I want to understand, you know, what, what, you know who's, who, what, who's your audience, you know, who, who are you targeting? I think before the call we talked about, you know, majorly been there in Midwest, uh, you know, part, part of US and you're looking to expanding into other areas, right? Uh, but who's your, who's your audience and what are the sort of products that you, that you, uh, uh, that you sell on the, in these particular outlets? So the audience for the retail location? Yes. Well, what we've been able to do successfully is we have created a brand that is that that what we what we're trying to be is we're trying to be right in between, let's say Starbucks, which is a fairly pretentious brand, and then McDonald's, which is might be considered a, a blue collar brand. And what we're trying to do is we're trying in the specialty coffee space, we're trying to sit right in, in the middle of those two, uh, those two brands and feed off of both sides. So if somebody's going into McDonald's every day and they walk into a Big B coffee, they're going to be very, very comfortable. It's going to, it's going to feel natural and so on. But, but similarly, somebody can walk in from a Starbucks, walk into our concept. And again, it's going to make sense. They're going to understand it. And, and so we're a very, um, you know, we, we, our brand caters to everyone. And we're kind of the, we're, we're the, we're the uh, specialty coffee for everyone, for middle America. And, you know, Starbucks has done very, very well capturing the, the sort of high end market, you know, that that's what they do. Uh, but we're, what we're going to be is we're going to be the coffee for, for everybody. Interesting. And, you know, I want to understand what, what are the sort of numbers that you've done uh, uh, you know, last year, especially, or uh, possibly you can talk about this year as well. And, uh, uh, you, know, you know, what is the, what is the average revenue per outlet, which, which comes for uh, Big B Coffee? You know, we, we um, the, the average revenue right now is 607,000 US um, per year. Got it. And, and so that's that, oh, oh, six hundred seventy thousand dollars, is it? Yeah, six hundred and seven, six oh seven. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. And um, uh, you know, uh, we we're recording uh, 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 here in the middle of the COVID times, and I, I things are definitely opening up. But but how 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 are things um, you know shaping up at uh, uh, at your company? You know, what are you doing uh, uh, so that you know the morale of the of the of the employees are there and you know, uh, uh, have you seen an improvement uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, since, you know, the, the com uh, country has opened up? Well, you know, Michigan was one of the very first uh, states in the United States to get hit with COVID. So it was New York okay. and it was Detroit, Michigan. And, and so they both got impacted really dramatically, really early. And so our state locked down quite aggressively early on. And, you know, we, we saw a, 
a, a sizable decrease in revenue. We were, we were down 38% at one point over last year. And, but what we've been able, and so that took it, we, that was like three weeks into it is when we, we were at negative 38%. And then we've slowly been climbing back on mother's day here in, um, uh, in the United States, which I think was May 11th, we we crossed over that week. We crossed over into positive territory from last year, and then we've been slowly growing it ever since. The last three weeks have been um, over 20% growth year over year, and you know, going into COVID, we were we were in the 14 to 17% growth rate range um, week of you know comparable sales. So right now, the last three weeks anyway, we've been growing more aggressively year over year than we were going into it. You know, I think one of the things that, that was the hardest part of all of it was the health and safety of the people working in the stores. And so we focused, that was our, that was our sole focus for, um, you know, a, a month was to make sure that we were putting policy and procedures in place to make sure that the staff was safe and, and could work in a healthy environment. And so, you know, I think that effort early helped us uh, with keeping staff and so on. And then it's, it's what's compelled our growth moving forward. Interesting. Got it. And, um, you know, I want to understand, you know, uh, when you, uh, you know, what, what is the secret behind scaling, uh, you know, from one chain to 250 plus stores, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, in India and, you know, Asia have also tried to do that. We've had stories about uh, looking coffee in, in China, uh, who tried doing that but uh, they had a, a you know ipo but now you know there's a lot of say that you know the numbers were, were all uh, wrong um, and, you know so you were able to scale up that up in, in, in 20 years but but what is the what is the secret behind uh, running a profitable uh, you know venture like that uh, and, you know any 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 thoughts for uh, asian market uh, where you know uh, you know the the coffee and tea culture is, is really going among the millennial generation? Well, I think one of the things that we learned early on, at least in Southeast Asia, so we have stores in Indonesia right now, um, and that's where we're building. Uh, our contract is for Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, and, uh, and Indonesia. One of the things we learned very early on in Indonesia was is that food was going to be a bigger factor than, um, than it is here in the United States. So, so we had to um, be more flexible with uh, the food category and that food was going to be a much more significant part of sales uh, than it is here in the United States. So that's one of the, one of the major learnings. The other thing, at least in Indonesia is retail is very different. So, um, you know, it's re very much mall based and that's, that's not the way it is here in the United States. And so, you know, you don't have these, you know, we have a, we have a strip center retail location basically on every corner and so that's the strategy for building coffee shops. And so in, in, in Indonesia, anyway, these malls, they're, they're like, um, they're like, they're huge environments and the rent is very expensive. And, and, and so, and the spaces are, are larger than we're, we're accustomed to. So, you know, that's, but the, the flip side of that coin is, is they generate just an incredible amount of people <laughs> like there's just it's a ton of people walking into these places so you know it's that was a little bit different um i'm really leaning on and depending on our um our owner there uh to help us figure out how to tackle the um the, the business and he's a really conscientious guy he's been in uh, retail food service his whole life he's built the he's got the largest um uh, burger chain in, in, in Indonesia. It's uh, a and W. So a and W he owns, he, he himself personally owns, I think 250 a and W very successful a and W root beer uh, stores. So um, he knows what he's doing and he's going to, he's going to help us walk through and figure out the right things to do with the concept in order to tackle that marketplace. Uh, and and when, when you get into partnership, you know, you know like you talk about in Indonesia, you go of, uh, you know, a split of 50 50 percent or you know uh, what, what, what is the kind of uh, business relation that you get to do yeah so internationally what we what we would put what we've put together is their their master franchise agreements and so it's not there's no equity um, 
there's no there's no true partnership there except that you know he's he is committed to building a certain number of stores or for a certain number of years and he owns the exclusive rights to that marketplace and so you know but what we've all, I'd have always said is I'm not that interested in going to other countries until I have a, a partner, um, a master franchisee that I believe in. And so I've had, I've had a hundred conversations with people around the world about taking my concept to different countries and so on. But until I believe in that person, um, there's no moving forward, you know? And so the relationship and who that, who that individual is, is what is absolutely critical uh, to us. Very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, Michael, I, I quickly calculated, I think you're doing around $150 million uh, of, of revenue a year. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, how do you, how does a founder and entrepreneur, uh, you know, look at a revenue generating mindset? Because uh, you've been quietly building uh, the, the, the business in US and it's massively successful, uh, you know, doing $150 million worth of business uh, a year. What, what is, uh, how, how does, you know, an entrepreneur look at, you know, really scaling it up and having a mindset that he is able to, uh, you know, scale it up and be as successful as he is? Well, you know, I think one of the things that, that my partner and I are, that we're very, very similar in that building the business for us is, is not about um, a different lifestyle outside of the business. We both live sim pretty simply. Um, yes. We don't. We don't have toys. Uh, we don't have second homes. We don't. Uh, we're 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 both really close to our wives and our families, mm -hmm. and and that's and so building the business. It's like a game. It it's scaling the business is the value we get out of it by the excitement and the energy around it, and uh, it isn't necessarily. I I think for us. Um, we're just trying to get more successful at playing this beautiful game called business, you know, and it's the most complex, interesting game in the world, in my opinion. And so we're always strategizing about how to grow and what we can do and how can we get better. And, and so the act of improving and scaling is what's motivational to us. And so I'm, I, I spent the last four days really in, deeply engaged in the conversation about starting an enterprise that would finance our stores. And so you could step into our world and open a store and then we would, we would lend you the money to start the, the business. And so like it's gut wrenching and it's difficult and it's hard to, to, to get my mind around doing that, but that's, what's exciting. <laughs> you know, that that's, that's the value. And so, you know, I, I think, um, that's what keeps us going. And I think a lot of successful entrepreneurs that I know, it's really about, it's about the game. It's about the excitement. It's about the adventure of it all. It's not necessarily about, you know, buying a third home and, you know, some vacation spot or something, you know? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, before the call, you also talked about you, you, uh, you know, your educator and heart, and you uh, uh, do teach a class at the University of Michigan, and uh, uh, and also you uh, you building a uh, building something called Life Lab, which is about building you know a, a culture, uh, a loving culture inside work workplace. So, um, so you know, can you talk a little bit more about Life Lab and what what is the purpose behind? It? Well, you know, um, we. It was about five years ago that we had an, an epiphany uh, that we were growing the business. Uh, it was growing pretty rapidly. Uh, and there became this moment where, you know, adding one more zero to our income statement or to our tax return, just it, was, it, was, it wasn't going to be fulfilling anymore. And so, and at that same time, we were beginning to realize that our culture and our, inside of our organization was sick and our people were struggling. Uh, and we had a lot of signs coming at us that the environment wasn't healthy. We spent five years working hard on figuring out our culture, what we wanted our culture to be, 
And in the end, what we determined was that our purpose as an organization is to support people in building lives that they love. The business model does that because when we help somebody build a successful business, which is our core business, that, that they, will, they will use that asset and they will use the proceeds from that business, we hope anyway, to, to help them build a life that they love. But what we realized was, is we weren't living up to that kind of a mission for our own people, for our employees, for you know, our vendors and so on. And so what we, what we ended up working on, and I'm, I'm trying to boil five years worth of work down into a, <laughs> a relatively brief statement, but we came up with a curriculum that we are deploying to all of our people. And the curriculum is about you know, supporting somebody and having the opportunity to build a life that they love. And we think there's some fundamentals that, that, that people need in order to feel like they have that opportunity. And so Life Lab is, is now a full curriculum. Uh, we're enrolling people into these classes um, and we're deploying it outside of our own organization now. And so, you know, for, for three years, it was all internal uh, work being done. Uh, now, for the first time, I think in, I think in March, uh, was the first class that came in that had people external to our organization in it. And, you know, we're really working hard to bring that to the world. And uh, we hope that we can get corporations like ours interested and supporting their people going through that curriculum. And, you know, interestingly, you, you pointed about, you know, the, the culture wasn't, uh, you know, you felt the culture wasn't that uh, great in you know, a couple of years back and you rebooted and you looked, looked into uh, uh, seeing that, you know, you need to build a better culture. But is it really possible to, uh, uh, to you know, uh, reboot uh, a, 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 the cultural values of, of a company and, uh, and reset it, basically? Uh, and uh, you know, uh, are there any other examples uh, that you uh, that you looked into and you imbibed into your company? And uh, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of talk about culture and values, but 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 what is it that you know you felt in the last 20, 25 years that you work with uh, with employees? What what is it that they really would want? And what, what is the message you would want to give to founders who are looking to you know build the right culture uh, in the company? Well, I think, you know, what we, uh, so, so to sum up what our culture was like before this, you know, it was kind of, one, it was a situation where it was kind of like a, an unhealthy, um, almost abusive relationship between two people. I mean, our, our organization took advantage of people. We worked them like crazy, you know, and, and I don't have guilt around that because, you know, we were, we were a startup. Uh, we were we were working really hard just to survive, and you know, at some point, uh, an organization, I think, m most healthy organizations that 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 turn into sustainable enterprises, make a transition from bootstrapping to a more healthy environment, right? So, you know, and I think um, the second part of your question is is what what. Uh, what do I recommend that people consider who are running companies that want to make some kind of a change or, or I think you, you called it reboot. Um, you know, I think that the, the, the primary thing that occurred for us is kind of a hard thing to get your head around is that when we talk about supporting people and building lives that they love, we are not talking about supporting them and developing skills to become a better employee to make my partner and I more money. What we're talking about is supporting them in building a life that they truly love. So what that means is some people are going to leave us and we're going to support them in leaving us to go pursue this other, this other life, this other passion that they have. And we know that, right? Going into a lot of the conversations, we know that, that if, this per, if we can support this person in pursuing that, that perfect life, the life that they, that they love, that means they're going to move on. For example, we have a woman in our, our business who's just, you know, she's tremendous. Uh, we love her. Her, her, ultimate, her ultimate passion is to start a cupcake company. And it's like, well, 
great. And by the way, we're, we could partner or, you know, we could be a customer of yours and buy a lot of cupcakes. <laughs> right? we, so, so when people leave and pursue their passion, that they are still supporters of our business when they're gone. But here's the real magic. Those that stick around and decide our company is the avenue they want to pursue in order to build the life that they love, they are going to be incredibly powerful people for our organization and for the world. And so that's the mentality that you have to shift into in order to buy into what we're working on, which is really truly supporting people in any dimension around this, this idea of, of building a life that you love. And, and it's a hard, it's a hard path to cross for some because it's like, well, you're, you're really encouraging people to leave you. It's like, well, yeah, I am. But I also expect them when, when they're with us, that they're doing a great job and they're worth every penny we're paying them that, that, you know, it's an exchange. It's a, it's a beautiful exchange. And then if they decide to leave, great, you know, and then oftentimes we've had, we've had experiences where they come back at some point and decide that they want to be part of our organization in perpetuity. Very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, you also went on to write uh, a very successful book, which is called The Grind, uh, sorry, Grind. And, uh, you know, what made you write the book and, uh, uh, you know, what was, uh, what was the premise of, 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 the, of that particular book? Well, the, the, the idea behind it started because, you know, I've, I've done a, a, a fair amount of reading in the start, business startup and entrepreneurship space, if okay. we're going to call it that. And, you know, what I found is that the, the authors were either you know, these highly successful, you know, people, they have nine figure net worths and they're flying around in private jets and they're looking back at startup through rose colored glasses and, you know, they don't capture the essence of what being an entrepreneur is. And then the other group, the other group writing books on entrepreneurship, they're academics studying entrepreneurs. And so they don't capture the essence of it. And so, so grind was really, the focus of grind was let's capture the true essence of what the startup moment is going to feel like. And so what I really focused in on in this book was from that, that, that you're, you're an entrepreneur, you know, like that day of conception where you, where you commit to starting the business. And then I wanted to go through until the first day of positive cash flow, And that's all I wanted to write about. And, you know, there, there's no, there's nothing in my book about, about exit strategies or legacy or, you know, leadership or, you know, it's, it's really, what does it take to get from conception to your first day of cash flow? And the first chapter of the book, the premise of the first chapter of the book was, is that, Everybody talks about due diligence in business. So you're out mm-hmm. studying market and you're studying competitors, you're studying pricing, you're studying costing, right? You're, uh, you're, studying, you're studying capital requirements for the business and so on. Nobody ever talks about doing due diligence on the entrepreneur, on the person. And it's my opinion that the most important factor on whether a startup is going to succeed or fail is the person, is the entrepreneur. Do they have the chops to see this thing through? And so why don't we spend time doing due diligence on the human being that's going to be starting the business? And, and then it goes from there. But, but I've never heard of that before. I've never heard of that premise before, which is, hey, let's, let's do a deep dive on, on the individual that's going to be starting the business. And you talk to private equity firms, private equity firms are really interested in the person, <laughs> right? Like the, the right person gets funded pretty easily because they believe in that person, that person's had successful startups in the past or whatever it might be. They know that. They're just not sharing that with, with everybody else. Okay. Interesting. And uh, you know, one of your goals is also to own uh, Detroit Red Wings. Uh, I'm not sure you've already bought it or not, but, but but you know, how did that goal came in between? And you know, uh, 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 how how did you get on to set such you know big uh, audition goals? Well, so growing up, I um, that was my favorite thing to do in the world. 
I was a hockey player and to go to the, to go watch the Detroit Red Wings play was, yeah, it's nothing I wanted to do more. I believe that the, the Red Wings are the heart and soul of, of, of my, my hometown here, you know? And I, I had a, I had an opportunity when I was 20, I don't know, 20 years old, 21 years old um, to be the stick boy uh, for the, Red Wings, which basically meant you were like the, sort of the assistant equipment manager for the team. And I remember, I remember telling my dad uh, that, that I had this opportunity and I was considering it. And my dad looked at me and he said, the stick boy, you should own the Red Wings. And he walked away, right? Setting this, I mean, of course, setting this extraordinary expectation, which maybe wasn't so fair, but you know, in the end, that's where that hatched. That's where that, that idea hatched. I, I, of course, my first dream would have been to play for them. I clearly <laughs> wasn't good enough to play for, you know, one of the best hockey teams in the world. But, um, you know, and, and so then the next, well, then the next thing to do, the next coolest thing to do would be to own them. And so uh, that's where that idea came from. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really, a, um, to me, I think, it, um, you know, from you're familiar with Ted Turner, who started CNN. Yes. Yeah, his dad, his dad coached him. I just, I read his biography recently, and his dad coached him. That the number one piece of advice he gave Ted Turner was, most people don't set their goals high enough. Yes. And Ted, I want I want you to set the highest of goals. And Ted Turner did. And Ted Turner had, I mean, that guy was unbelievable, right? All the things that he did, and so I guess that's kind of where I am too. Is is why not set the highest goal? Why not set the highest goal you could ever dream of? And, 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 you know, it doesn't have to be something as ostentatious as owning a sports team, but, you know, I have a, a good friend of mine who has decided that she's going to raise uh, $10 million for um, make a wish foundation. That's awesome. You know, okay, like okay. how great would that be? Okay, interesting. And uh, did you finally uh, go on to buy Detroit Red Wings or are you planning to do that in the future uh, soon? I got a long way to go. <laughs> I got a long way to go. I mean, it, you know, they're, they're, they're worth, uh, you know, I don't know what it would be today, but probably somewhere between 500 and $700 million. Right. So, um, and, and that might be a low estimate. So I've got a long way to go, but you know, I wake up in the morning and I go about my business and you know, I, I still think I got a chance and that's pretty cool. You know, if, if I can get the engine going uh, and get the RPMs up a little bit higher here and, 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 can, and um, propel growth, I, th I think I still have a chance. Yeah, very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, since your start as a, as a barista in, 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 in the chain that you uh, started your career to become the, the, the co-founder of, of a more than $150 million company, uh, you know what, what keeps you going uh, i mean is it is it legacy is it creating uh, you know uh, wealth or giving away money like what uh, what uh, you know uh, uh, warren buffett or you know billions want to do what what keeps um, somebody like you you know whose who's net worth is hundreds of million dollars or uh, you know keeps you going forever well i you know um i i I think it kind of goes back to, to my earlier answer. It's, it's the desire to get better. It's the desire to stay in the game. And, you know, I, 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 as you probably know, people too, who sell their businesses at a young age, um, there's nothing to do, <laughs> you know? And so I, I think I would, I don't really want to go back into a startup because I, I enjoy I enjoy the, the size business I have today and running the business I have today. And so, you know, I think it's what keeps me going is um, it's really the, the excitement of, of uh, engaging the, the company every day and waking up and having things like this to do, uh, which I, which I really enjoy. And by the way, I thank you for having me on. And, you know, it's, it's uh, so, so it's not about wealth creation. Um, I'm, I'm okay. You know, I, I'm going to be able to put my kids through school and, and I'm going to be able to retire I'm, at this point. I, I know that's for sure. And I don't have grandiose material needs. And so it's not about wealth creation necessarily. Uh, it's really about having interesting things to do when you wake up in the morning. And this business gives me interesting things to do when I wake up in the morning. 
Great, great, thanks. Um, um, I quickly want to do the top three. What's your favorite business book? My own book, Grind. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so my favorite business book, I, I think probably Michael Gerber, The E Myth. Right, right. It's, it's brilliant. Got it. And you know, if you could go back in time, say ninety-seven, ninety-eight, when you when you started your career there uh, at Big Beef Coffee. Uh, what is one thing you would have done differently, or uh, you know, any any one thing you would have focused on hmm. differently than I did? Yeah. Well, I think I think I just I probably my life would have been nicer had I been a little more patient. Um, I think that the results we created would have happened. Either way, I was just really impatient. And, and that just means I was unsettled and I was always, always striving and, and grinding as hard as I could. And maybe that's what created the business. I don't know. But, but I, I, I wish I could have been a little bit more patient and, and understand that the, the results, results will happen. You know, uh, nothing happens as quickly as you think it's going to. Nice. And do you have any favorite online tools, for example, Gmail, Slack, Zoom? Well, I mean, I'm married to Zoom now, right? I mean, we all are, yeah. um, and and it's been it's actually been uh, it's actually been better than I would have imagined, uh, right. and so I, I act, you actually can create a connection with people uh, through right. a computer screen, which is which is my you know my my kids have been telling me that for years, and I never believed them, but <laughs> but you can, uh, you know, a favorite tool for me, I, I would have to say Office three sixty five, Microsoft's right new suite right. it is really powerful and so the the document sharing capability um the, the the virtual meeting capability where you can share documents it's it's that has been oh my gosh and we you know we just deployed that internally like january and so we we got we just barely squeaked in before the covid thing happened and so um but if you haven't if you haven't used 365 office 365 it is it is it is really a powerful powerful suite of software and that's, a, that's an amazing tool uh, you know we'll, we'll put that on the show notes uh, so michael what is the best way people can uh, know about the book grind and what is the best way people can reach out to you well make sure so it's, the book is uh, the website is grindthebook.com but give me like 48 hours because i'm just rolling out a new uh i'm taking the blog from what's called the blog to the classroom and it's it's just way better and so if if i think we're going to deploy it i hope in the next 48 hours i've been working on it for about a month and so um but grindthebook.com is where where we're uh, where where all that information is yeah and uh, you know what is the best way people, people can reach out to you uh, if you're there on social media uh you know probably the best way to reach me is is you know i mean i i do text right so i have my phone number in the book uh and people are people are texting me and and so you know that's the most efficient way um and at this point it hasn't gotten overwhelming enough where i can't handle it but but you know linkedin is great um and uh and texting so my phone number it's 517-388-1444 and uh, that that'll come right to me my my phone's right here in my pocket and and you know i get a couple texts a day and they're fun Right. And, and, uh, and, and we, I've talked to a few people too. And, and I remember when I got my first phone call from a reader, <laughs> it, was just a, it was such a cool experience, you know? Amazing. You know, uh, we'll, we'll uh, put the numbers on the, on the show notes as well. Uh, all right, Michael, thank you so much for, for taking our time and speaking to us. I really enjoyed speaking to you and, and you know, uh, knowing about your story and it's been a very inspirational podcast for, for me. Oh, thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm just uh, honored to be here. And it was a great interview. You did a great job. Thanks for listening to the Life Self Mastery podcast, where we teach you how to start and grow your online business. For more information, visit Rohit's blog at www.lifeselfmastery.com.